And that was yeah. the first part of the conversation. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was trying to get to hear you at that point. I mean, I had this, your know, mouths were moving, but no voices were coming out. It was quite pleasurable, really. But, um... <laughs> Remember, we experienced you the same way, Dave. <laughs> and, um, it's interesting, Zoom won't take a reset in Mac. You've got to restart Zoom with the right settings on Mac for which, in which sound you're using. That's a new discovery. Oh, there you go. I'm making a note. Um, all right, well, we'll, we'll leave it to the uh, magical editing powers of Nigel to take this part of the conversation out. And uh, welcome everyone to, I think this is round six of a series of conversations that we've been having on organisational design. Uh, Matt Skelton and Manuel Pace are still otherwise engaged on uh, useful and billable work. So uh, we'll continue the conversation without them. Um, the implication is you're not, is it, Andrew? All right. Hey, it's ten o'clock at night here. I hope I'm not on billable work. Um, the uh, there was a really useful piece from the community that came out last week, uh, which piqued a bit of interest. Um, Toby Sinclair was kind enough to take the last five hours of conversation and turn it into a what well, what seemed like a nice starting point for a set of principles. Hey there. Uh, Recently, I've been looking shit. through the comments underneath my video. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Jave. <laughs> Good morning. I apologize. I was trying to clean up my tabs and I opened a YouTube tab. I apologize. Oh, we're gonna leave that bit in. <laughs> <laughs> you were at you'd actually had us turned off and you were watching that in parallel, weren't you? I know. <laughs> Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't need all of his intellectual capacity to listen to us. Um, so yeah. So uh, yeah. A, we had a really nice uh, piece written up by the community uh, by a, a gent named Toby Sinclair, who took what we've been talking about over the last five or so fortnights, and wrote a set of twelve principles. Um, and what we thought we'd do today is. First of all, have a bit of a conversation about the thinking that that's inspired in the group, but then maybe go through and have a look at those principles that Toby's written up um, and have a bit of a think about where we agree with them and where we think that they might need to uh, change a bit. So I might hand over to Nigel to kick things off today, given that he's <coughs> an internet celebrity now. Well, I'm just, I'm just reading the things and actually as Jabe was doing what he did, I, mean, I was reading about the hope despair cycle. So uh, I thought that was quite apt, but um, I'm just going through it. I mean, I'm going to keep looking at another computer and what I'll try and do if I have time to edit this, I'll put in some of this stuff onto the screen as overlay. Um, but he's come up with this collection of organizational design principles. I'm not going to read all 12 of them out. We can probably go through some of them. Um, I think what he's done, and Dave gets mentioned quite a bit in this, of course, but um, he says the false, false belief that organizations can be designed. So I think that's the first place to start is that he, he says that organizational design is a central flaw that creates an assumption that an organization can be designed. And he then goes on to describe why the parts can be, then uh, they, they think that the people there, the, he says, typical organization design looks like looks at the individual parts and the people layer the spans, the people, oh, the people, the layers and the spans, the parts then assembled together to deliver the optimal results. And he goes on to describe this. Um, and then he sort of goes into things called the hope despair cycle meditation, which is interesting uh, by saying senior, is it mediation? No, meditation, he says, senior management are, are abstracted from the organizational design. I think that comes to a little bit what we were talking about the other week about the role of executives in this. Um, and uh, then he goes on about cognition is not distrib distributed, um, work at the abstract level is uh, not in the detail. Um, and then he talks about conflicting goals and ineffective metaphors. But he references you, Dave, at one point, the importance of constraint mapping in the hope despair cycle. So I don't know where this leads. I mean, the hope despair cycle, the, this is caused by designing for an ideal target state and then trying to move towards that. So this is very much like trying to set 
this is what the organization will design. It's like saying this is what the culture is going to be. This is what the organizational design is going to be. And then we start, you know, PDCAing in a lean sort of sequential manner to get to that target state. Um, comments so far? Because I'm rambling. No, I, I think it's wrong to reject the concept of design. The issue is what do you design? And I think that's the point we were making. You can design scaffolding, you can design interactions, you can design energy allocation devices. Yeah? I think the problem is the metaphor has been a sort of civil engineering design one in which somebody wants to know exactly what they've got to do within what tolerance limits and then you go away and do it. And I think that's the point where I said, you know, we got this sort of Stockholm syndrome relationship between organizational design and the CEO. And they've got them into this mentality that they have to do these big exercises all the time, each one of which actually fails. So I think the, it's, it's not so much design which is wrong, but the metaphor and the objective of design which comes into it. What the hope despair cycle is, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, ironically, I'm just currently rereading Maltman's theology of hope because that's highly relevant to the current situation yeah along with other theological concepts like grace and it's and hope isn't the opposite of opposite of despair it's like Eagleton's concept that um, of hope without optimism um, which I really like yeah um, so I, I think I, I, the, the, the temptation to create cycles and, and dichotomies is always a bad idea yeah, I mean, he just basically says um, this is caused by designing for an ideal target state and then trying to move towards that. You end up in a, you will end up in a uh, hope and despair cycle. You should avoid designing for a target and a target end state. Instead, define starting conditions and let the design emerge with a sense of direction. Okay, well, it is probably more for your employees. It will be a cynical cynical cycle i mean they know it won't work but they'll go along with the language i mean that's the other problem you've got is od has now become a game and anybody of any competence has learned to play yeah f find out what new buzzwords are yeah and use it i mean christ i knew that in the 80s when i was a general manager i remember going onto the mckinsey's website to discover what questions they were going to ask me so i knew how to answer them in order to, for my business unit to be in the top right hand box of the matrix and I remember after I explained what I'd done to the financial director, I got pulled out of business management and put into corporate strategy. And I'm still not sure about that, but it was a, it was an interesting phenomenon. Right? I mean, most it, 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 very few people these days in any organization have any hope when you announce a reorganization. If anything, that's where the despair cre 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 creeps in. Well, then that's where the whole the whole Drucker immune system pushing back statement comes in, which is the minute you tell you've said this before, Dave, the minute you, you tell somebody going through a, a change or a, a, some sort of transformation, all those people have been there more than five years and definitely those have been there more than 15 or 20 years go, well, we've seen this all before. We'll just sit here and resist and be belligerent for long enough and they will eventually go away. And in the main, that's actually what happens. They just resist long enough and we go away. So that's never going to solve anything. All right. I'm, I'm going to jump I into. I, I actually had, I had a couple of things uh, that I wanted to talk about with that one. Uh, I, 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 the hope cycle despair thing that he's describing, I've used uh, this, this idea that I call uh, gap thinking versus present thinking. So gap thinking is this idea of creating an ideal future state, identifying the current state, and then identifying some sort of plan to close the gap, right? And this is like prevalent in like almost all OD or even kind of like uh, OR research, right? Like th this, is, this is the systems thinking concept of how to improve yeah. the, the world. Uh, there's, there's a couple real distinct issues with it. Uh, what, the first one is that like, uh, you basically are, require that everyone in the organization admit that the current state is wrong in order to get to the future state, right? So you have to say, like, what you're doing right now is wrong. And everybody has to admit it. You admit that you're wrong and you're going to get better. Uh, and it, you know, doesn't seem, seems like a good way to kick someone's uh, resistance up right away, right? Uh, the second thing is that, uh, executives spend a huge, de depending on the size of the, the, the gap, yeah? Uh, 
the size of the identified gap and where the executives who's trying to get this change to happen lives in the hierarchy. Uh, the higher up, the bigger the gap can be. Yeah. So, cause they have bigger timelines in theory. Um, and the bigger the gap, the more social capital or trust or whatever, however you want to talk about it, the more political capital you have to expend to secure the initial drive towards that future state. So basically, executives spend a huge amount of effort to get everybody in the organization to agree that is the future state we want to go to. Now, the problem with that is, you know, it's a sunk cost fallacy. As the, execute, as the organization moves towards that future ideal state, all of the people involved know that you don't want to tell the executive that you're not going to hit that state, right? And the executive doesn't want to hear it, and nobody wants to deal with it because of the social capital that was invested to achieve. It was so painful to get that initial kind of gap identified, right? So I think there's, there's all sorts of problems there. And the, the last one really quickly on gap thinking is just um, – Futures are always ideals. They're always ideals. They don't exist. They're always ideas that you have. They're not real, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that they can't have real agency. They can't have an effect. They can't cause people to believe or not believe or want or desire different things, right? But they don't exist. And the, the result of that is that you get this kind of, you can't test the future, it's, it's, it's non-testable because it's, there's nothing, there's no correspondence to test it against because what it's going to correspond to does not exist right now. It exists only in the future. Uh, and the result of this idealism and stuff like that is that it feels good. It feels good to create that future vision. It's escapist. It, uh, you, you can imagine that you could be something that you're not, all these kind of like things. And the result of that is that like, People who have a tendency towards abstraction and idealism, upper management, um, likes this stuff, feels great. And not only that, it's really hard to prove that I'm wrong uh, because it's all going to happen in the future, right? Um, and so this, this escapism has a real distinct problem because one of the things that we want is to kind of like have some some sort of coherence moving forward in time like there should be some purpose that the organization is al aligned around if that's not the right word exactly but um but the fact of the matter is that um all that futurism all those future idealisms mean that it's really hard to return to the present yeah, it's really hard to focus on what's actually happening right now. It's hard to come back. It's easy to go forward, right? And so I think that the result of that is you get a lot of discussion in, in organizations, especially during organizational changes, that discuss, are we going to hit the future state? As opposed to constantly returning to where are we and what is possible from where we are, not, not from where we want to go to. And that returning to the present, and it, the present doesn't have to be an instant. It can be like an extended period of time. But that switch from gap thinking to really thinking about, okay, lightly, where do we want to go? Solidly, and most of our discussion about where are we, what is the dispositions of the system, how can we move from here? Where can we go from here? That discussion doesn't happen enough in organizations. And the difference, I think, is, is the difference between believing that you can engineer or plan your way into a change versus actively engaging in a process of ongoing redesigning of a system. Yeah, uh, Real engagement. Go ahead. It's more, it's more pernicious than that. I mean, I think yeah. you know, it, it's always been a distinction I've made between systems thinking and complexity thinking. Systems thinking focuses on closing the gap to a future state. Yep. Complexity thinking focuses on changing the present. Right? And yep. I think that's a lot of us have said that. But I think it also goes with the adoption of planning cycles on investment. So originally there was a huge amount more intuition of tacit knowledge in making the investment decisions and judgments. But then we got into the return on capital employed, the spreadsheet mentality, a lot of which was driven by consultants and the desire, I think, 
this is where I'm going with this, to avoid responsibility for having to exercise judgment. Yep. And a huge amount of what came in with systems thinking in the 80s is effectively the delegation of responsibility for judgment into process spreadsheets and consultants. So mm -hmm. rather than carry the can for something, you do that. And with it goes the rise of what I think is one of the most pernicious things about modern consultancy, which is the use of therapeutic metaphors for consultants. <laughs> Yeah, and that consultants have done this all the time. And what it implies is that somebody, you know, that the organization and its employees need therapy. And of course, that privilege is the therapist. I mean, generally, it's the therapist who causes the conditions which require more therapy, right? Oh. In, in that sort of sense. And I think all of this came together with what I, it's, it's kind of like a, a weird form of paternalism. Yeah, in which you basically surrender judgment to third parties. And that actually applied to CEOs as well. I think as caught in it as anybody else's. Nobody forget fires fired for implementing a McKinsey's report. It's just like nobody used to get fired for buying IBM. It's the abrogation of judgment and the abrogation of responsibility. And it's being reinforced by the consultancy profession. Yep. And we, I think we talked about that quite a bit in one of the other sessions that the, the, uh, the, the whole outsourcing model is the delegation of re responsibility yeah. and accountability to others. So therefore I cannot be blamed. We made a decision. We employed somebody to do it. They made a mess of it. We fired them. We'll employ somebody else, but it was never my responsibility. Um, just pick up on what you were saying, Jay, because the very beginning of your uh, sort of piece on, on uh, gap thinking, you just described PDCA, you just described the lean world, yep. the, the North Star, the target condition, or well, the ideal condition, the current condition, and the next target condition, yep. we PDCA towards that. Um, but I just want to just check, you're not, ad you're not advocating that for all design, or you are? I don't, I, I don't advocate that. It, it, taken in the, the way in which the target state or the North Star becomes an actual target as opposed to a constraint or a modifying system, right? That, that is there primarily to narrow the search space, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that when you think about that, like next step, like that, so in, in Kata, right? We got like right, current right. state, uh, challenge state, and there's this vague, like, cloud usually dri driven with like a, a path through it. To me, the target ch or the challenge is primarily about constraining the cloud, the search space, and not about actually achieving it, which is hard to explain to people. But if you're doing current state first, like if you're constantly returning to where are we and what's the disposition of the system, that should you shouldn't care about that stuff it should be more of like we have a general idea where we're going with this now I, I think this is one of the things where the move the move from like pdca applied to machines yeah where, where there can be an explicit target state i need this machine to make 300 nuts per hour I, that's what i need has to do that it makes 250 right now what can we do to achieve my target state that is something that is you know, amenable to direct scientific correspondence theory style experimentation. The other version of it, which is a socio-technical system change, has so many variables involved in it, especially from the socio side of it, that there is no way of doing explicit scientific experimentation in order to move to the tar target state. There can only be a constant return to where are we and what are we capable of from here and what is desirable to do from here? Um, and, and I think that inverting it like that for socio-technical systems where, where the start has to do with the primacy of what is happening as opposed to the primacy of what do we want to happen um, it is, is important. And that's not to eliminate that second question. It's just to say it's subordinate to the first one, in my mind. I, I put Dave. one qualification in on that, though, which is that um, one of the ways that you can manage a complex system and ke still keep explicit targets is to have contradictory targets, which force yep. negotiation within the system. Yep. 
So I used to target my salespeople on orders and my production people on profit and let them sort it out between them. Yep. Um, so I think there is a role for targeting. Um, the danger is when you mix it in with this other ridiculous systems thinking concept that everybody has to be aligned. Yep. You know, the common yep. values, common beliefs, common alignment, common goals. Um, which is, to be frankly, one of the most dangerous things anybody can propagate, because what you do is you totally destroy resilience. Yep. And by the way, that's a real agile disease. Yeah. I don't, you also, I don't te- you also literally to tell people what to report back. Yeah. We want do. to do this. Okay, you want to do this? So I'm only going to tell my manager about things that yeah. are achieving towards that. I know exactly what to say to get a pat on the head. It, it, is, it is so counterproductive. Yeah, so I, I don't, I don't disagree with des- designing contention into reward systems, um, but I think that you need to have really strong informal networks which aren't squashed in order for that to be effective. So I think if you're a leader that recognises the value of the informal networks in the system and the fact that feedback might sort of slip around the edges when people aren't bearing, being trans- transparent or ethical, that's fine. But if you design reward systems without that, then you're probably putting uh, putting a few things at risk. That's why I kind of prefer the the idea of shared accountability uh, and and designing the tension into the shared accountability rather than into explicit accountability for individuals. You, you have to have you have to have a mechanism by which people can have an agreement or a dialogue. All right. I mean, it was it was quite interesting when I was working with the World Council of Churches. It was absolutely fascinating because if you work within a religious organization, you've got a body of things that people can't challenge that you can fall back on. <laughs> right. And yeah, the, the equivalent in the modern organization, for example, is profit. So if I take my attention example, if the salesmen don't make sales, then there won't be any business and you know, the company will go under. But if you don't have profitable business, the company will go under anyway. So there's kind of like a, a mutuality between the support and the sales. So there has to be a mechanism for the, them to have a conversation, yeah, as, as much as informal networks. But I, I think we're also trying to swing the pendulum a bit here, which I think one we need to do is the concept of alignment is a very, it, it, it's an engineering, it's a software engineering metaphor. It's not even a civil engineering metaphor. It's a desire to remove uncertainty. It's a desire to know where things are, right? Um, and it, it, it's really problematic because the exercise of judgment requires a comfort with uncertainty. And if you remove uncertainty, then nobody will be able to exercise judgment and you get into this vicious, spi- vicious spiral. Yeah. And that's when you also get the disintegration into, you know, fake news, false news, opinions, counting more than, all of that sort of comes from that piece. So I'm just going to, that might be an interesting segue because one of the principles that uh, Toby had written on his website was focus on sympoetic systems rather than autopoetic, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, poetic systems. Um, And he's he's sort of talking about, you know, the forest, the community, everybody using a common language set, open groups. And then, of course, he references some of the team topologies work of collaboration (laughs) service provision between service teams, facilitating, diagnosing, providing temporary support, and then coaching and mentoring stuff, which sounds a little bit like what you were trying to describe in the last few minutes. Is that right? I don't know whether there's any yeah, thoughts think, on that. I mean, autopasis and, and symbiosis are not opposites in that sense, right? If I've heard you correctly. I mean, well, I, 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 I've been suggesting the term sympoiesis, which comes from a um, uh, bunch of work by, um, damn, I'm not going to remember her name right now. Anyway, uh, Donna Haraway. But, but the idea is to say, like, uh, I, I feel like auto, yes, that book, which is lovely, isn't it? It's really lovely. No, yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's so, handy, you can see, all right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, so the idea here is to roughly say, to link it into some of the discussion we've already had. Autopoiesis, I find, tends towards atomism and tends towards individualism. It, it's about how an individual thing is related to its environment. Um, yeah. And I, I think that lends, it's, that view lends itself to 
partism or to psychologisms like the the way that that a lot of coaching kind of focuses on individuals or psychological as opposed to sociological uh, ways of inter intervening and and inter interventions whereas uh, symbiosis is about the relationship between multiple organisms and the environment. So it's the idea of coevolution and, and, and these things. So I think that that sympoietic concept of an organization stabilizing itself as a group of, of systems in relation to an environment lends us towards more of a socio-technical theory, uh, more, uh, more of a sociological theory uh, of how organizations are, and would lead us to focus not on so much on atomism and more on something like communitarianism, negotiation, and things like that. Yeah, but you, you, you need some heavy qualification on that. First of all, if you go back to Mantuana and Varela, and I think this is one of the things they split over, is the atomism, not atomism aspects. Yep. And for them, autopoiesis was always a metaphor. It's never been founded in biology. Yep. Right? It's, it's a metaphor, all right, in that sense. And that's actually quite useful in socio-technical systems. Um, because actually things like what our work, for example, on tropes, strange attractors, and assemblages, effectively assemblages is a human form of an autopoietic system. Yep. in terms of the way the boundaries are maintained. There's a body of work we can draw on that. But then you've also remember that all symbiotes start off as parasites. If we go into the biology on this, it's a transition from parasitism to symbiosis, which is key. And then you get mutual, mutual interdependency, and that's part of a biological process. And that requires a degree of conflict, suffering, pain, and death. <laughs> yeah? And kind of like, you, you probably can't have one without the other would be one of the points here, right? So, um, and I don't think we actively manage for symbiosis because symbiosis is mutual interdependency of independent organizations. So things like lichen are a, a symbiote, all right? But the best one is probably the Portuguese man of war. And I've never forgiven IBM because when we set up the Kinevin Center, our image was the Portuguese man of war because it's a, a series of independent entities which come together and marketing didn't like it. So they substituted a picture of a jellyfish. <laughs> yeah, which completely missed the bloody point. Yeah. Um, but, but that concept of you know, once the Portuguese man of war is formed, yeah, then it's autopoietic in Morales sense of the word. And once you're dependent on the bacteria in your gut because they're no longer parasites, you've ne you, you now actually have a boundary condition that you can't escape. And it's, it's that ability to know when you make those things fluid and when you make them non-fluid. Yep. Because there, there's points where you need to change the nature, and this is changing interactions, not changing things. It's point where you want to make old interactions impossible to maintain so that new interactions can form rather than trying to change people. And effectively, that's a way of breaking an autopoietic symbiosis, you know, to re-engage with a form of, say, mutual parasitism, which can then become symbiotic. So when well, I was I like looking that. at this stuff, I... Um, I need the tried, transcript on that. I, I, tried to, <laughs> I, I tried to reduce it to something a little bit more practical. And where it kind of landed was, all right, so you've got... If you design the scaffolding, <laughs> if you design the scaffolding for teams correctly, then leaders, a, a competent manager, should be able to help a good team to emerge to be fit for purpose and in in context. So where leaders should be spending their time is on the interactions between teams, and I think there's two key interactions that are of use. So first of all, the stuff mm -hmm. that Manuel and uh, Matt were talking about in terms of how do you really focus in on, I suppose, the cognition required for teams to communicate with each other. Um, so there's three things. The second one is the informal networks uh, that, that Dave's talked about when he talks about social network simulation. And I think the other th third one, which we haven't touched upon, which but which is fascinating, is when Jade talks about the three economies within an organisation and how you've you kind of need to ensure that the process from novel uh, of, that novelty can smoothly 
cross organizational boundaries that might not necessarily be set up particularly well to handle it. Um, and I, th I thought that was like, if, if you, if you were doing those three things as a leader, fo focusing on uh, t team interactions, simulating the informal networks, and also uh, how do I promote novelty uh, through into um, both both from from out my uh, systems of uh, differentiation to my systems of scale and back again, then I've kind of nailed most of the most of the issues. Um, I'm just gonna I want to come back on to the, what you were just saying there, Andrew. But those three things they're actually quite a lot for a leader to learn to do effectively. But just to wrap up the anti poetic sim poetic thing. Interestingly, one of the examples, and I don't know if it's right or not, that Toby gives is that in, um, in autopoetic systems, he's talking about expert driven tasks for task forces and technical jargon. So that really is the world of the consulting organization. So they they come in and create that system, which is actually the antithesis of what we're trying to create, which is this sort of, you know, if we talk about informal networks, we talk about novelty, we talk about team interactions. They're trying to control the system, not allow the system itself to thrive and to evolve. Yeah, but language is critical. I mean, I've just been going back through all the early Kinevin frameworks because it's the 21st anniversary of Kinevin this year. Yeah, so we're kind of like one year older than Scrum. Yeah, and Agile. So that's the, yeah, that, there's precedent here, right? Um, and well, if it started off with me looking at abstraction against codification and the necessity for expert language. Because actually, if you don't have expert language, can, you know, at, at, at the lowest possible level of abstraction, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of like, you dumb it down to the point where there can be no communication whatsoever. At the highest level of abstraction, that's where I share all my own education experience and background and have a conversation with myself, which sometimes isn't the most intelligent audience I get, but I worry about that, right? <laughs> so there's, there's actually an optimal field between the two, which is, and I called about, I, I used to talk a lot of, and I'm, I'm bringing this back in at the moment, because having rediscovered old articles, you suddenly realize it was a good idea and you forgot about it. The concept of a lower and upper level of acceptable abstraction. I, there's a range of abstraction that you have to understand in order to participate, in order for communication to happen. Yeah? And that mustn't become platitudinous. So a large amount of that language is experiential references. It's common experience and common understanding. It's not just a sort of formal language that can be understood by AI. And I think one of the problems with consultants is they may, they, I call it the tyranny of the explicit. Nothing can happen unless it's explicit. So you can't learn in a workshop unless you confess your sins to the consultant. I mean, most consultants are sort of frustrated Baptist ministers wanting everybody to come to the mercy seat every Saturday, right? You know, a lot of these things are experiential. They don't have to be articulated. I just want to say, Dave, that sometimes we feel like you are having a conversation with yourself and we're just casual observers. I know. <laughs> It's good. It's good for your soul. So I, I don't don't object to doing it. <laughs> so one of the other Dave, things I've noticed. Oh, actually, you go, Sonia. No, I just wanted to say something. Dave said now reminded me of a topic that um, Nigel wanted to discuss last week around absorptive capacity, and I think this idea because. To, to be able to absorb something new, you have to have something to build on. And I think this idea of, you know, a, a, a range of abstraction that you have to understand or a particular language, I think sometimes it's a bit of a barrier to learning. Um, if that language does not exist, so you've got nothing to latch onto. That's where I find an analogy and metaphor very useful. But I, I do think that, you know, we also, we shouldn't demonize hierarchy. And I also don't think we should demonize expert language. You know, it's... um. What is fit for function, I, I think. I, th I would agree. We don't want to definitely want to de demonize expert language or we're all out of work, which is a problem, um, at least in my, con in my lens. Um, but at the same time, that if an organization just starts to rely solely on the external experts to curate and to sort of guide everything, then you start to lose some of those aspects of the organization emerging, yeah. evolving, and the 
Is it this is where you come back to the stuff that Max Brasser and I scribbled on a tablecloth in sieges a long time ago, which is the role of narrative as a, as a point of contact between purely tacit and purely explicit. Narrative allows you to communicate across multiple levels of abstraction because it resonates with people. So, for example, some of the work we do is not to have organisational goals, but to have agreed stories about where we don't want to be. Because it's easy to get consensus on where we don't want to be. And that leaves fluidity around where we could go and openness to variation, which you don't get. So there are different, and, and Sonia's hinting at this with the concept of metaphor, but narrative works at a very different level of abstraction. Because effectively narrative has what you might call sort of micro resonances with people's experience. Yeah, and, and that allows us, you know, those multiple micro resonances across it allow us to understand things that we wouldn't otherwise do. I'm going to connect what you just said, Dave, to what Jabe was saying earlier on with gap thinking, because actually, if, if you start to think about this, narrowing in on that North Star by describing all the things we don't want to do, or we don't want to happen, or where we don't want to go, is actually a much easier conversation than all saying, this is the ideal state we should all target, because that's, a, that's sort of an explicit state, a sort of definitive state, rather than to say, well, these are all the things we don't want. It's like bringing red teaming sort of ideas into that by saying, these are all the things we don't want to have happen, don't want to achieve, because as you write, people will agree of all the things they don't want to happen more easily than the things that must happen. And then that gives us a narrower focus and then we can start to move hopefully in some way incrementally towards that. But I, I just linked that. I don't know if that makes sense to you two, but it did to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's, there's two things like there's this, uh, when you, when you think about narrowing, I think about like, uh, narrowing the, abstractions that we're using to discuss something as opposed to pointing at something and, and I usually explain like what Dave just explained I explain this way like if everybody closes their eyes uh, imagine that you're on a horse and you've got a big stick and there's a very large lizard in front of you uh, and you have a sword like all of you, I assume, go, oh, well, you're like, you're a knight, and there's a dragon in front of you. And, but none of us had to discuss what kind of dragon was or what color it was. or any, And none of us had to explicitly say knight. And if I asked you what you were going to do in that story, you would be able to tell me other stories about it. Like, I should attack the dragon, or I should run away from the dragon, or, right? Um, so there's this, there's two points to that. One is narrative to me works kind of like a regex. It allows us to not have discussion about lots of details that actually eliminate things that shouldn't be eliminated in the first place. We care about all dragons, not just red dragons, right? Um, so the narrative gives us a way of like regexing or finding a set of things that are in a particular relationship to each other. Oh, we see these things are in this type of relationship. From that, there is a disposition that we now have by having this narrative that says, these are things you can do when you find these things configured this way in the world. This is how you act, right? And so what we're allowing ourselves to do is use these small narrative captures to allow people to understand how to act without specifying exactly how to do the action. These are the possibilities that lead from here. Yeah, these are the possibilities that lead from this configuration that the narrative lets you, lets you think through, right? And then I would just really quickly point at, because I, I want to do things like this as a designer, I think that it's like, uh, I think it's very interesting that narrative does what it does, but I like to point out that the way you got to the narrative by, is by describing the things that you saw, the materializations in the world that are configured in a specific way. So for me, undesigning things, like literally removing the sword from the story somehow, is actually how you create new narratives or you change narratives or you disqualify narratives. Because if people are using those narratives to find certain types of configuration in the world, if you remove the materials that enable that specific configuration to exist, those narratives don't get uh, activated. I'm sure Dave will give me a better word for that. 
Go ahead. Now that's, called, that's called a counterfactual. So yeah. what's a lot of the work I did in my DARPA days was to actually construct counterfactual game environments. So we had the one famous one we did is where the South win the Civil War. Yeah, and that's still in use to today because it forces a counterfactual forces people to think differently. So, so counterfactuals is one way. Um, the other, and you know, the other one, for example, I had a big game in a software company, which I ran. So we had an annual user group, which was called Mugs, because it was Merco user group. So everybody got this ceremony and mug each time, but everybody had to rescue a Welsh dragon from an e e evil English knight. So you can introduce a you counterfactual. Know, I was thinking, no, hold on a minute, because I was thinking when Jabe was saying this, you know, St. George, you know, the dragon, and, and the, the dragon was the red we're, dragon. We're, and we're the, the only bloody the... nation in the UK whose patron saint is actually comes from our own nation. The rest, <laughs> I mean, Patrick was Welsh, and Andrew and George came from Palestine. But the third and most interesting, there's a wonderful Star Trek episode every man manager should be made to watch from the, future, from the next generation called Darmok. Yeah, and if you haven't seen it, watch it, because they encounter a species who only speak in metaphor. And the only way they can communicate is to create a shared experience which they can reference. Mm. Okay? Now, that actually links in with this concept of linkages. And, we, and thinking about this, Sonia, we should really bring Darmont back into the training, yeah? Because it's, it's a wonderful episode. It's now available for free, which is even better, right? in terms of the way it works, but that, that is that sh shared experience creates a common abstraction. Yep. Yeah? So the doctors I go walking with every weekend, you know, we now have a word called, you know, do not turn right into the heather. If, if in that group you say turn right in any heathery environment, everyone will go, oh my God, what's about to happen? Because it's associated with an encounter with bramble bushes in a thicket, which definitely wasn't a metaphor for complexity, but a harsh, and cruel reality, all right? So shared experiences bring a use of language which is much richer, yeah, than, than any taught course. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's a perfect example or, or the, the, the negative version of, of what Dave just pointed out is like, uh, how many Agile teams have you been in where you're like, you seem to be using all the stories we use, but you're not actually doing anything like what a real, I, and I, I, I'm going to get yelled at for this, right? But a high performance team would look like, right? You're not a high performing team. You're using all the same stories and narratives. You've somehow never, at, you, because you never had the shared experience of working on an, a high performing team, you don't know what good looks like so you're using metaphors and abstractions to describe behaviors that roughly fit the pattern but aren't actually productive and they don't add, they don't eventually add up right they don't eventually add up to a real performing team and so that, that's one of the kind of uh i think the problems um that you can get uh when you use this kind of thinking but anyway yeah, well, the high-performing team for most people, if they can get the work done in a week, they think they're high-performing. Um, and so if you know, all, the, all the backlog gets completed in the sprint, they're high-performing, which is not the definition of a high-performing team. So I think we could wander down the whole team science route in another conversation because there's yep. a lot we can talk about team effectiveness and, and how to do that. But I want to go back to what Turk did, and we've only got a few minutes, and I'm watching Andrew keep us on time, but... Um, there was there was principle that Toby was talking about temporal organizational design interventions was how he described it. Mm. And he says, when approaching organizational design interventions, you should be aware of the temporal nature of change. How long does the intervention need to exist for? Not all changes should be permanent. It's sort of wrapped into scaffolding a little bit. But um, he sort of said that uh, the categories of temporal organization or, des or temporal organizational design interventions need to be stable, intended to be fixed over time once introduced. Plastic, they change over time, or is that elastic? Plastic. Uh, ephemeral, yeah, ephemeral, lasts for a very short amount of time, not valuable for intervention. So that was, I, I started to see that was quite interesting that he was describing it in that way, is that when we do organizational design interventions, these, these, these things should be reasonably temporal uh, avoid overinvestment in, 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 in the intervention, easier to add up to organizations than remove, and that's absolutely true. 
And as a result, ephemeral in interventions are the hardest. Uh, be, be, yeah, he's talking about scaffolding again. Be careful to dispose of the intervention, take the scaffolding down. So again, that comes back to the sort of role of consultants and consulting organizations in helping organizations through this challenge. Yeah, there's some scaffolding isn't designed to be taken away. So microcardial lace, for example, is designed to dissolve into the system. So it provides structure and disappears naturally. Yep. So, I mean, that, that's where we get into typology of scaffolding. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. part of the design. Sonia. No, I just wanted to say, Nigel, I think there, there is a, a, not necessarily a shadow to that, but I think there's, there is something else to think about as well, because I think there's the, there's the very valid um, argument of, you know, designing scaffolds, designing things that are, temp, you know, temporary. Um, but then I think something that I see a lot of is that um, many organizations, especially if you look at things like um, organization redesigns, you know, so we restructure, we redesign, we, sometimes I think those are too temporary because, yep. you know, we, we go through these sequences. So, you know, somebody comes, they do a, a design, they don't actually give enough time for that design to settle for it to have the effect that they intended it to have. And then it's on to the next one. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a nuance, but it's, I think it's, it's about the intent, you know, are you designing something to be a scaffold or to be temporary or to dissolve? Or are you meaning for it to be permanent, but then you're not giving it enough time to actually have the effect that it's supposed to have? And I think both of those are, are kind of equally important. Yeah, I, I took it to mean um, be really, really resistant towards intervening in, in the system. Like make sure you're making a very deliberate choice if you're going to add extra stuff in because it's going to be really hard to get it out later. Um, it always feels like it's harder to put stuff in, but in effect, it's harder to remove stuff down the track. Um, that, that applies to systems, it applies to processes, it applies to, uh, to underperforming people. Um, the, so then the second aspect of it is, all right, if you're going to make an intervention, um, lean towards making it a, an intervention that is semi-permanent rather, or, or that's, that's, stable plastic or ephemeral or uh, microcardial is, or the, the other typologies rather than making permanent changes, uh, permanent interventions. Um, so kind of let the, let the structure follow the form, make the change, ensure that the change is a valuable intervention and then codify it if it's useful rather than doing all the upfront work to codify an intervention rolling it out and then finding out that it's not particularly effective. Um, and the third part of it was, yeah, when you, when you design something that's meant to be temporary, make sure you design the removal yep. part into it. Yep. We have to be careful that we're not advocating continuous organizational reshuffles here um, because some people will listen to that and think, oh, then we can, we shuffle the deck chairs every, on the Titanic every six months and, and woohoo, we're off again and, and, and nothing ever changes, which is not what we're advocating. Uh, so, like, I would point out really quickly that like the language that, that Toby chose, it, which is language I think that he got from listening to me ramble is not temporary, but temporal. And the, the, what I'm pointing at there is the movement from thinking of the organization as a bunch of objects that need to be rearranged to a bunch of processes that are interacting. What, yes, one yes. is like about a, a construction theory of, of object things that are relatively permanent right? Like atomism, again, the, we need to configure the atoms correctly to get the result we want. And the other one is about saying, no, 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 you know, you never step in the same river twice style thinking. These are processes interacting that create the appearance of stability. There is no permanence. There's only stability, plasticity. In other words, the ability for the system to be kind of nudged and like think, think again of like brain plasticity here, like your brain can rewire itself without you like rebooting, right? Like you, there's not like some switch that you turn on in order to get the new brain state that you're in. Um, and then finally, ephemerality, where the ephemerality has to do with 
like a not over in like if you only have one way of managing change everything is a permanent object reconfiguration then you use a hammer everywhere right the three different ways of thinking here are more like there's things that we want to hold stable in order to move other things around we need to have some ground there's things that we are want to actively manage the relationships between the plasticities. And then the femoralities are more like these are particular interventions that are meant to nudge, push, bump the system into a new place. But once it's in that new place, that may or may not be useful to, to think through. So to me, like the plasticity and the ephemerality side have relationships to the scaffolding theories that we've talked about. But all of these have to do with taking a process philosophy viewpoint on it, and then also understanding in the temporal nature of this, that all processes have historicity and futuricity built into them in order to keep them being recreated and reproduced. Um, so I, 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 that's a long way of saying like, it's not that everything is temporary, it is that everything is temporal, it, everything is in time. And noticing that and thinking about that is one of the ways I think of returning to present states and reimagining where we can go to from where we are uh, and where we are as a stable state of interacting processes as opposed to a stable set of things. Well, I know we're in the dying minutes, but I, I just wanted to, you made a, a statement, I'll replay the video to get to write it down again. But, you know, when you talked about, you know, moving from this idea of, that, that this old design is moving objects around, reshuffling objects, to talking about processes, which was the interactions between processes rather than the moving of objects. And I think that's actually a really good statement, a good way of describing it. Um, we're coming up on time. I know, Andrew, so you're going to call us to time. But I think looking at the discussion around what Toby's written up, I think it's a good base to start from. I think what I'm seeing is, I think what Andrew said at the very beginning is it's possible that a lot of the things he's written, once they're sort of massaged a little bit and refined a little bit, will collapse together and not be sort of, I think he put, did he do 10 or 12 principles, 12 principles, sounds very agile manifesto-ish. Um, but, um, <clears throat> but I think it will probably collapse down and some of the content will fit inside some of those descriptors. So I think, I think we need to discuss about in a future time how we uh, work to actually bring this into something we could probably, I don't know, turn into a charter. What do you think? You know, I mean, Agile's 20 years old next year. Maybe it's the right time for this. I don't know. I just, just thought I'd throw that out for Dave's consideration. <laughs> the, you uh, raise issues about writing deadlines with me and Sonia on the call at the moment. <laughs> there, there are hypersensitivities around this within cognitive right? Um, Andrew, back. To, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, th I think we need to go backwards and forwards. I think there is a golden opportunity to create a basic charter with associated methods, tools, and concepts around a radically different approach to organizational design. And I think, to be honest, we should try and get it out within a couple of weeks as a draft and engage more people in it. So I'm, I'm all in favor of that. But I think it needs us to all to do some work on it collectively before it's issued. Yeah, Because what we've got is we've thrown ideas around that there needs to be a little bit more coherence than that in it. Yeah, mm, in great. terms of the way it works. Andrew. Yep, that sounds like a great point to finish up. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for, for another great chat. Uh, yeah, I think as Nigel said, um, there's some really good stuff in what Toby's written. It feels like the levels might be a little bit different. Like something, some stuff feels at principal level, some, some stuff feels a little bit lower than that. So yeah, we'll do some work to try and uh, to, to level things and also maybe to introduce some stuff that uh, that that's not there that I think is useful at a principal level and, and, and get everyone else's ideas. But yeah, um, thanks again for the chat. Uh, great to see you all. And I hope you're, uh, hope you're all keeping well. See you in two weeks. See you guys. Thank you.